Good morning, church. Welcome uh, to church this morning. Thanks for those of you who are joining us at home. Uh, if you're coming in, come on in and have a seat. I want to give you a second to make it to your seat and have a second to breathe a little bit. Um, many of you guys know, my name is Nisha, by the way, and uh, I uh, teach uh, middle school math and um, I am always late everywhere I go, no matter what, and I'm a teacher, so it's, it's really weird when my students are in the class before me. Um, so that was happening for years. I've been teaching for 15 years, and the last two years they gave me a schedule where first period is free. And so uh, um, I've been uh, loving it. I was like, oh, for sure I'll get there, you know, now on time, and I'm even later than I was before. Um, but I spend most of my life running. Uh, trying to get from place to place, uh, get everybody dressed, get everybody to where they need to be. Um, and even some of you coming in this morning, some of you guys are really punctual. My husband's very punctual all the time. So, um, But um, sometimes after dropping the kids or coming in from the car and you're coming into church and you have to sit, it's so nonstop. And uh, sometimes we start the sets right away and it's like, get on your feet, clap your hands and let's all sing. And uh, it's, it's a lot, it's, it's much. So. Uh, today, though we want to start full and give all our praise to the Lord, I do want to give us a, a minute to find our seat and uh, to breathe for a second and sit, um, remembering and slowing things down and remembering who God is. Uh, this week I've been uh, kind of stuck in Psalm 23, uh, remembering that God is my shepherd and what that looks like. And for me, I'm one of the crazy sheep that are running around doing everything nonstop and getting lost, and I feel like... Uh, Jesus needs to put his hands and like, he makes me lie down. And I'm like, are you sure you don't need me to do this? Are you sure you don't need me to go get this done? And, and I think right now, um, I'm hoping for the next 10 minutes or so, um, you have a moment to just be made to lie down and rest in the presence of God. Last Sunday, we sang a song called, you, You've Already Won. And there's a lyric in that song in the second verse, we'll sing it again today. And it says uh, this, um, he gives manna for today, and even when it's gone, he's not. And then the next line says, he'll fix my eyes on Jesus. And when we sing that today, I want to encourage you, a lot of times, it's, I always feel like it's me. God, I need to come in here, and I'm going to meet with you. This morning, God, I'm going to be focused. God, I'm going to bring you my praise. And a good shepherd is just saying, just be still. Just be still. Just be in my presence. That's it. Don't, you don't need to do anything. He'll fix our eyes on him this morning. And so that's my prayer for us, church, this morning, that we would be still enough to let him do what he does and not be so frantic and then just sing and praise him for who he is. Um, so let me pray for us this morning as people continue to walk in and as you just sit for a minute remembering our shepherd. He's a good shepherd who leaves us not in any want. Let me pray for us, church. God, we love you this morning and uh, we have a desperate need for stillness. And God, you know my heart and I have such a hard time being still. And so even now while I talk and move and sing, God, um, I pray, God, you would settle my soul so that I would be at peace before you. And here in your church, God, my brothers and sisters in this place would be able to do the same that we would just be able to slow down and just sit before you and look at you and soon stand before you and sing to you, not trying to muster anything up, but just being ourselves before you. God, would you come and teach us what it's like to be in the presence of such a good shepherd. We thank you for who you are. I thank you uh, for time like this. And I pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Church, let's stand together so we can worship. Christ has won 
For Jesus there's nothing impossible his hands and feet and ultimately the battle belongs to him so I invite you to lay down your burdens lay down your fears focus on the one who made heaven and earth and let's worship him today man
love you for who you are. And uh, we sung again, God, uh, this cry, God, you are worthy of it all. Day and night, God, would you uh, hear praises from deep within us that, that we choose to remember all that you've done all of who you are. We cannot say anything otherwise, God. You, uh, you've done it all. You've, you've taken care of us so well that even in the things that we don't see, God, um, we make a choice this morning to trust you with all of our life, every bit of it, because you've proven yourself. God, we thank you for being so good. We thank you, God, for drawing near to us uh, every moment, any moment we turn to you, you're there. And I thank you for that. God, there's no one who is like you. And so we confess that this morning together as a church, as a community, we confess it. There is no one who is like you, God. I pray that your praise would always be on our lips. In joy and in sorrow, God, would we never cease to give you the praise that's due you. This morning, God, as we continue uh, to worship you through uh, opening your word and hearing from it, God, would you uh, give us eyes to see you and ears to hear you, God? And would you do a work that would change us from deep within? We wait on you to move, God, and you alone. You are the one who does work that lasts. And so, God, uh, have your way with us here. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's great to be with you. You can stay standing. We're going to meet the people around us in just a second. But uh, I wanted to say good morning and welcome. We're so glad that you're here. If we haven't met, my name's Jason. And if it's your first time with us this Sunday, just want to say a special welcome to you. We're so glad that you've uh, just chosen to be with us this morning. We'd love to meet you. And so I invite you after service, if you have a couple minutes, to stop by in the lobby. You can meet some of our uh, volunteers out there that would uh, love to tell you more about the church. Uh, if you'd like to let us know that you are here, you can use your phone and scan the QR code on the back of the, or it's on the front of the card that's on the back of the seat in front of you. Uh, that's a mouthful right there. <laughs> and uh, you can fill that out to let us know if uh, you have a prayer request or you're interested in any ministries here at the church and uh, just gives us a chance to follow up with you. Uh, but if you've been around, you know that one of the things that we love to do is give you a chance to meet one another and the people around you. So we're going to take a couple minutes. I encourage you to look for somebody that you don't know that well. Uh, introduce yourself by giving them your name. And then I want to give you kind of a quirky question to, to, uh, to share, if you're willing. So this week, we saw the launch of the largest space rocket in history by SpaceX. And the name of it was uh, the Starship something or other. But Starship was what caught my attention. And uh, it harkened me back to my sci-fi days of the Starship Enterprise. Uh, and so my question for you this morning that you can share with one another is, are you a sci-fi fan? And if so, are you a Trekkie, a Star Trek fan, or are you a Star Wars fan? All right, so I know that's kind of deep for a Sunday morning, but if you're willing to go there, uh, take a minute to introduce yourselves to the people around you, and I'll come back up in a minute. All right, we are going to uh, turn a corner a little bit now, and... Uh, uh, take a look at the passage that today's message is going to be out of. As you know, we're in a series right now looking at some of the parables of Jesus out of the book of Luke. And this morning, uh, Steve will be teaching from Luke chapter 12, uh, verses 13 through 21. So before he comes up to teach, I'd like to read that for us. It says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? 
This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. So can we invite Steve as he comes up to teach? Hey, good morning, Hope. Yeah, it's great to be with you. Welcome to those of you watching online. I know many of you are watching today from different parts of the world, and we're just glad you're here with us. Uh, we're, we're talking money. That's what the topic is. Now, I know the minute you hear somebody at church say we're talking money, you might feel a little uh, uh, nervous, uncomfortable. Here's the thing. Jesus in the parable never asks for money, and, and I'm not either. It's very clear Jesus' teaching on this topic is not about raising funds. If you know about Jesus' financial situation, he doesn't own a home. When he dies, he only has the clothes on his back. There's no inheritance. So you get the sense when he's talking about money, it's out of pastoral care for people. Now, the other thing you need to know is money's the second most frequent topic he preaches on. He, he talks about money more than prayer, more than heaven or hell. Uh, money is of central importance to him. And, and the reason why is is because Jesus sees that how we view and deal with and think about our money is directly tied to our spiritual faith. They, they are somehow connected, and, and maybe more than that, they're, they're in competition. He has this quote that he has, this phrase. He says, you cannot serve both God and money. It, it, it's interesting. He, he, he basically, if you think about it, and, and we've taught this, that God, when he designed humanity, gave us free will. His hope was that free humans would choose to freely worship him, but we have choices. There's competition. And it's fascinating to me that Jesus names the greatest competition to God's rule in your life and his leadership is money. I would not have thought that. I, there's so, several other things I would go, sure, but, but he goes, no, 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 no. There, there are two entities at war for the leadership of your life, and one of them is money. Uh, this is strange, right? Because if you think about money, you go, money isn't my boss, is it? But let me give an example. I own a dog. Who else owns a dog? Anybody else? Yeah, I own a dog. This is the first dog I've ever owned. However, there are times when I wonder if the dog owns me. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, like in the middle of winter when it's like zero degrees, and he goes, I got to pee. And I go, I don't want to go outside. He wins. I, or I have to clean up the mess he makes. It's either way, I lose. And it's kind of that way with money. That in some ways, what Jesus is saying is, you, you have to be very careful that money doesn't become your boss. If you do have the wrong mindset, it actually can drive your behavior. It can run your life. It can actually disrupt your faith. It can actually... Move God out of your life and take his place. You can't serve both of them, he says. You can only serve one. If you're a Christ follower, if you're a Christian, the Bible's clear. Your job is to be devoted to God and to follow his leadership. He gets to lead your life by your choice. And he's saying some of the times, without you even being aware of it, God, money can kind of sneak in. It's deceptive like that, and, and it can lead you. And so in the midst of this parable, the setting of this, this is in the center of Luke, this gospel, Jesus is teaching to a huge crowd, much larger than this. And, and he is, and you can get the sense they are dialed into his teaching. That's why Luke, Luke has them so transcribed years later. He, man, he has them. He's teaching. In the midst of that, somebody interrupts him. I'm so grateful that you never do that to me. It's so nice. Luke says, somebody in the crowd, we don't even know the person's name, someone in the crowd says to him, Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Uh, side note, it, I've discovered anything I'm dealing with in life, there is a Bible verse that can help me with it. Uh, you, if you don't know, like if you're facing a problem, I highly encourage you, if you don't know, you, I don't know the Bible, just Google, what does the Bible have to say about this? And see, inheritance, actually Jesus, a couple of his parables are specifically about inheriting money. And Jesus gets the sense that this is one of the most dangerous moments in a family. When, when someone dies and, and there's an inheritance and the heirs have to figure out who gets what. Incredibly dangerous. It's a chance where relationships break, families break apart. I've seen this firsthand as a pastor. Uh, somebody took the thing that I was supposed to get. 
Somebody took more than they should have. Somebody got left out of the will. And, and brothers and sisters break apart never to speak again. Families break apart. And Jesus saw this. And, and that's what's happening in this moment. You can pick up from this that what has happened is a father's died. And in Jesus' culture, the oldest son would take on the responsibilities that the father had running a business, running the household, but also it was the oldest son's job to divide the inheritance. So this is the younger brother, maybe multiple younger brothers. It's clear some amount of time has passed. And notice the younger brother doesn't say to Jesus, Jesus, it's been a brutally hard time in our family. And I know my older brother has a ton of weight on him. And I know he's got a ton of grief. Would you pray for him? He doesn't say that. He basically says, Jesus, tell my brother. And by the way, the brother was probably right there. Tell my brother to give me what is owed me. There's, there's no gentleness, there, there's no, there's no like, respect, there, there's no empathy. Give me what's mine. Hmm. How's Jesus respond? Jesus replied, man. Okay, pause right there. It's never good when Jesus doesn't go like son or brother or friend, but he goes, dude. <laughs> dude. Who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? He basically goes, I'm not going to do what you want. You want me to do your business for you, to demand him give you your money. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to fall into this little trap you've made in front of everybody else. I'm not going to do it. Then he says this, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed because life doesn't consist in an abundance of possessions. Watch out, be on your guard. This is, uh, this is like military language that he's using. In Jesus' day, you'd often have a wall around the major cities and there would be a gate for an entrance and guards would be placed there. And if there was a threat that was coming in towards you, they would call out the guards and they would say, be on your guard, take up arms. That's the kind of language this is. Jesus is saying for your life, be on guard. Guard the gates because greed Money wants to get in. And if you don't guard it, it's like an enemy invading army coming into your city to take over. In the same way, he's saying, greed's like that enemy, and it will take over, and it will run your life if you're not careful. On guard. Watch out for it. Be aware of it. And, and then he says, watch out. And the phrase is, all kinds of greed. This stood out to me because I was like, all kinds of greed, just greed, right? Are, are, there all, are there lots of forms of greed? Doing my research, I found there's a whole line of psychology research today all about greed. Talk about a horrible amount. That's the last thing I would want to be interested in. But they study greed, and they found the same thing. There's lots of different forms that greed takes. I'll just share a couple of them with you. This is what they found. They found there's envy, which is, that's where you're resentful or jealous of what someone else has and you wish you had it. There's selfishness, which is prioritizing your own interests over the needs of others. There's insatiability, where no amount of wealth or possessions makes you happy. You just can't stop. You need more and more. Then there's stinginess, which really is one of my favorite words. And it's basically you're cheap, which, which some of you know I value cheapness, so that one hurt a little. Um, <laughs> There's even, I found, a test you can take, the Heinzelman greed scale, a 50-question test you can take to find out if you're greedy and which form you have. I thought it'd be fun for us today to do the test together. Wouldn't that be great? 50 questions, we can do them together. When you're done, pass them to the person to the right, let them tell you how greedy, can you imagine, that'd be fun? I thought I'd save you that, but I chose to take the test. The test has these 50 questions, one to five. One, you don't have a problem, five, you do. Here's just a couple of them. Number one, everyone around me has so much more. I didn't put a one to five, I just wrote yes. <laughs> I'm a pastor living on the North Shore of Chicago. Okay, maybe that, okay, I gave it two. That could be there. I take pleasure owning expensive things. Uh, I was like, that's, uh, that's not, I don't feel that one. I gave it a one. I worry about losing what I have. I thought, man, I did when I bought all that Bitcoin. Now it's a little better, right? <laughs> then the one that got me. 
I don't like sharing what I have. I was like, wait, that, that's not greed. That's, why, why is that on the greed scale? And I was like, oh, this might be one for me. Get, uh, this, I, as I thought about it, I kind of paused the test. I said, let's do a quick inventory. When have I seen this in my life? And I remembered grade school. There was a year in grade school when I graduated from the eight Crayola crayon box to the 64. This, kids, you may not understand, this was like a big day for me. And I remember during that year, the girl sitting next to me had a day where she leaned over and she said, can I borrow your burnt sienna? (laughs) Now, I had never touched burnt sienna. I even wondered why this is even in the box. And somehow I looked over, she had used all her burnt sienna and now needed mine. I was thinking, what in the world are you coloring in burnt sienna? And she asked, can I borrow yours? And my response was, no. And she said, it doesn't look like you're using it. I said, I haven't used it, but I might. Because it's mine. Now, I never used burnt sienna, but I wasn't going to give it to her. Get your own, right? Years later, I realized I was going through this inventory. The second date I had with my wife, the woman who became my wife, second date in college, we went to McDonald's for dinner. Stinginess might also be one of my issues, but (laughs) we ordered at McDonald's and the woman behind the counter asked my future wife, would you like French fries? And she said, no. The woman then said to me, you know, would you like fries? I said, yes. And she goes, what size? And I thought about what, basically I did a quick, mathematical process to determine the large fry was exactly what I needed. The extra large would be too much. Small, not enough. Large is perfect. So I bought it. The woman who became my wife went and sat down. Food was delivered. I carried the tray over to the table. Before the tray hit the ground, she reached over, grabbed a fry, and ate it. And I said, I'm, I, 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 did, I thought you didn't want fries. And she said, I didn't, I'll just eat some of yours. <laughs> and I said, if I knew you wanted some of my fries, I would have gotten the extra large. But if you're going to eat these, I won't have enough. I'm thinking, this is probably my last date with her. Anyway, who dates someone who steals fries, right? <laughs> now I'm like, she must be like, what kind of monster am I on a date with, Right. Maybe I have a problem sharing, huh? And that's where I was like, ah, I'm prepping this sermon for you. This one might be just for me. So I'm going to unpack this whole thing on greed, but I want you to understand this whole study, the more I thought about maybe what I wanted to share with you is the more I said, I think this one might be for me. So feel free to listen on what I'm learning, but maybe God has something for you too. Uh, One more thing I found, which is so funny. I I wanted to know, in in this field of psychological research, has anyone done studies on American culture specifically? We're going to study Jesus, which is about Middle Eastern culture from 2,000 years ago, but our culture, how are we doing? And there's a brilliant uh, psychologist who studied this at Princeton, Robert Wurzel. He wrote the book God and Mammon in America. And at the end of his studies and his surveys, he had this conclusion He said, what we found in all our studies was 86% 86 of Americans agree that greed's a sin. And 80% of Americans said that they wish that they had a lot more money. (laughs) Which leaves us in the interesting position that the vast majority of people agree that greed is wrong. And they say, I am not greedy. I just would like a lot more money. (laughs) And that's it. It's deceptive. And, And that's what he was pointing out is you it's really hard to see greed. It, it, it's, it's incredibly sinister. It, it sneaks in. It, it, it's hard to assess. So I, I, as a pastor, so this will be my 30th year of pastoring. I've heard so many, yeah, I didn't, that was not, that was not the intent. That was not. In my 30 years, I have heard some crazy confessions of sin. I have yet to hear someone come to me and say, I'm greedy. And I don't think it's because people are hiding it. I think it's because it's really hard to see it. It's hard to know. It's hard to know it's there. Which is why I think Jesus teaches on it so much. So let's go back to this. 
He confronts this young man saying, I'm not going to divide the inheritance. He then teaches him, be aware. There's lots of different kinds of greed that will sneak in, so guard your heart. And then he tells a story, a parable, to make this come alive just a little bit more. And he starts the parable and he says, there was a man, or the ground of a certain rich man, yielded an abundant harvest. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. Okay, real quick in this, the guy in the story is rich before the story begins. He was rich before this. And then there's a day where in his farms, an unbelievable, unexpected a harvest came in, exponentially greater than he thought he would get, right? Now, something you have to get in the story, and Jesus points everything out here. Who yielded or what yielded the harvest? Can you see it? It's on the board. Three, uh, come on now. Who, what yielded the harvest? The yeah, this is an easy one. It's the ground. See, this is the thing about farming. Farmers work incredibly hard, but they don't control the majority of things involved in their jobs, Right? The soil, obviously they can work on the soil, but the the soil has to be good. Rain, if you get too much rain or not enough, both are bad. The sun, you you can get too little sunlight or too much. The weather, you can have hail that destroys your crops. Bugs, you can have bugs. that. There's so many things that can destroy your harvest. So a farmer of anybody would say, oh man, a great harvest. Aren't we blessed? Look, Look what God has done. Isn't this great? Uh, Jesus' listeners at that point would have known exactly what this man should have done, right? Actually, the Bible's clear, especially for someone in agriculture. If you receive a great harvest, first thing you do, you get on your knees and you say a prayer of gratitude to the creator who made this, the one who controls the weather and who blesses you. You start with a prayer of gratitude. God, thank you for all you've given. Two, you would immediately give a tithe, 10% of all you brought in. You'd give to the temple. It was immediate. You knew what you had to do. That's two. Three, If you have surplus, you you leave some for the poor, for the widows, for the orphans. You leave some out in the ground, and they can come grab some. It's very clear. These are the three things you're supposed to do, right? What does this guy do? He receives this abundant harvest, and then it says, he thought to himself, what shall I do? Pause right there. He thought to himself, in our culture, this makes sense. The ancient culture, Jesus' culture, this would have stood out because key moments like this were not done in isolation. You didn't solve problems by yourself. You invited friends, family, the community in. You'd allow others to speak in. What do we do with the harvest? Learning. This guy, either afraid of what they would tell him, has not included them, or maybe more likely, his wealth has already isolated him. It's one of the things that actually wealth does. If you're not careful, it isolates you. Go do a study on people who win the lottery and what their life is like before the lottery and after. One of the things you see most frequently is they start with tons of friends and family and afterwards they trust no one. Everyone wants their money, so they isolate. That's what this guy does. He thought to himself. He didn't pray, he didn't give. He went internal, said, what am I gonna do with this? He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns, I'll build bigger ones, And there I will store my what? Surplus grain. My surplus. There I'll store the extra. There I'll store the stuff I don't need. Surplus. All right, it's easy to be judgmental of this guy. He has a lot more in common with us, though. The more I thought about it, most of us have a surplus problem, don't we? How many of you have a basement? And how many of you store surplus in the basement? Yeah, me too. I had to go down and clean out stuff. I was like, I didn't know I had half of these things. Even in our country, there is this growing industry, growing for the last 20 years, where you can rent your own miniature warehouse. When your basement and your attic are out of space, you can get a storage unit. Isn't that awesome? And if you die or forget to pay it, they'll auction it to somebody else. We're not that different from this guy. Many of us, like him, have more than we need. And we're consistently going, what am I going to do with the extra? Many of us, just like him, go, oh, I've got to get a warehouse. I've got to get a storage unit. We've got to buy a bigger house with an attic so I can put things there. He's, he's not that different, is he? What am I going to do? I've got it. I'll store it in a bigger barn. 
Then he says, I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. This guy, I'm be honest, this guy has lived out our dream. He built a business. It was successful. He saved his money. He didn't waste it. He got to a place where he could retire early, get a vacation house, travel, enjoy your life, get a membership to the country club. He's got it. This is what we want. And Jesus says, the very next sentence that God says, you fool. Woo. Jesus, if you've ever studied him, the, the word fool, he's very careful with. Actually, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, when he describes thou shalt not murder, he expands it and says anybody who calls his brother a fool is guilty of the same thing. He's very thoughtful with us. That's where he's very strongly saying to this man, you've wasted your life, you fool. And notice the soliloquy before this, his little internal monologue before this, he says the word I, me, or mine 11 times. 11 times is all about him. And here Jesus pivots and he says, instead of I, me, mine, it's God's words. He says, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? He's echoing Ecclesiastes. If you ever read that book, Ecclesiastes is an Old Testament book written by a very wealthy individual who is incredibly successful, but towards the end of his life, he looks back and he goes, I've invested my whole life building wealth that I don't get to enjoy. Somebody else will get to enjoy it. Same thing. You fool. You spent your whole life doing this, but this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Demanded from you, the language Jesus is using is a lender's language. In essence, Jesus is saying, God loaned you your life. It wasn't yours. And now he's asking for the loan to be repaid. Your life, some people say my life's a gift. Yes, it is. But in many ways, this is saying your life's a loan. It's not yours. It, at some point, it will be returned to God. At some point, God will demand life's done. It's the difficulty of life, right? It, 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 life is like a, it's like a milk jug with no expiration date, right? You don't know. This guy didn't know either. Three people thought that was funny. <laughs> I, I worked a long time on that one. Yeah, yeah, that was not good. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? Hmm. You go, why is he a fool? Because his whole life was about himself. His whole life was building up wealth for himself. His whole life was storing for himself. It was all about me. And what, what was happening was... God had given him more than he needed, but he couldn't get past it to realize he could do something powerful with it for others because greed had taken hold of him. It was all about him. It was all about him. Jesus says, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. Jesus says, this is how it will be with whoever. That includes you and me. Jesus is looking at his audience. He goes, this is how it is for each one of you. And, and he looks at every person for eternity. God's saying this. Any person who with the short amount of time God gives you chooses to make their life about making more and, and keeping more and holding on to more, you're a fool. That's what Jesus says, Jesus' words. Because you haven't thought about the things of God. And it's very clear he's saying you, in this life with your time and your money and your possessions, you can invest in two different things, right? You can invest in yourself or you can invest in the things of God. It's your choice. He allows you to choose that. And you can be rich toward God, it, meaning you can invest in the things of God. In another spot, he says you can put treasures in heaven. And, and the idea most people interpret is, is, is you can take the resources you have and use them for God's purpose. Care for the poor, care for the sick, try to alleviate suffering, try to expand the gospel, try to build places for those who don't have a home to have a home. There's different things you can do to express God's love to others, and it's like you're making an eternal investment. But he said the danger is this sense that it's all mine. Is this mildly convicting to anyone other than me? Yeah. And it's sneaky, right? It's like you don't even fully realize that it's happening to your heart and your mind. That's why I think Jesus taught about it so much. And the fascinating thing to me is 
candidly, we have so much more than his audience did. His audience, if you study it, most of them had one extra pair of clothes, just one. Jesus, you know, when he died, there was no will because all he had was the clothes on his back. It got divvied up amongst the centurions there. Most of them had little more than that, a house, a little bit of land, a pair of clothes. They didn't have a 401k, a retirement plan. So they didn't have any of that. So how much more dangerous is it for us in, in a time when we have so much? So what I want to do is actually for you, give you just a quick, really just what's the Bible say about money and how do we kind of do a heart check and a mind reset on this topic of money? Can we look at what God says and then start to apply these principles to our lives, okay? So these are just a few principles you see from the beginning of Scripture to the end to help us get our minds right so that we can live this out, okay? So principle one, biblically, it says this, everything I have is God's, I'm just a steward. This is when you say that's mine or when I said that's my crayon, it's not right. It, everything is God's, right? This is what it says in Job 41, 11, everything under heaven belongs to me. That's God's words. You get it for a season, a few years, but then it goes to somebody else. And he's saying, don't get caught up in thinking you own this. Realize you're a steward. You get it for a season. And how you use it is going to determine, are, are you wise or are you foolish? Next one, uh, even our ability to work is a gift from God. That's the, temp the temptation is to go, I earned this, it's mine. I went to work, and certainly those are true. But the Bible says your ability to work is actually a gift. This is from Deuteronomy. Remember the Lord, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Your ability to work, your good health, your wisdom, your brain, all of it is a gift from God. Continue, it's this one, it says, my heart follows God's money. Again, if we're just a steward, it's not my money, it's his. But your heart, the Bible describes, follows it. The verse for this is Jesus' words from Matthew 6, where your treasure is, where the thing you value most is, there your heart will be. Beautiful about this is there's two ways you can view this is your heart, your treasure is going to tell you what you value, but you can change where your heart goes by giving. So if you go, man, I, I want to have a greater heart for, for, for homeless, start giving to a homeless ministry and watch your heart follow it. If, if you go, there's a part of the world I wish I cared more about, give to a ministry towards that, and your heart will follow that. That's one of the nice things in this is, that, is you can intentionally lead your heart by how you give. The next one, giving is the antidote to materialism and greed. This is from 1 Timothy. It says, command those who are rich not to put their hope in wealth, but to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they'll lay up treasures for themselves and take hold of the life that is truly life. Timothy here is capturing the same heart that Jesus had, which is, I want you to have a full life, a meaningful life, a good life. And part of it is don't, don't give in to this desire for more that's going to govern you and lead you and rule you. The last one, if your life's focus is acquisition and comfort, you got a problem. If you go, really, that's what I want. I want to get more and I want to have an easy life. And, and this is Jesus' words, guard against every kind of greed because life isn't measured in how much you own. So those principles are there. Just, again, make sure your mind is right and see have you kind of gotten off kilter? Have, have you gotten confused? you think it's mine? Have you gotten confused and think life's about acquiring things? Is it about my comfort? What is it? And you go, oh, no, Jesus has in mind a very different kind of life. Now, Jesus was very clear with them in that day. And, and I would say to you, again, the only person that can control this is you. So listen to me as your pastor. You, you want to be wise about this, not the fool. The day you stand before Christ, you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant and steward, not, oh, you, you wasted the life I gave you. You, you want to hear words of, of gratitude and joy from God on that day. But that's your choice. And, and in this, you need to hear this, that it, in my life too, and again, I think I've been honest to you today, that this has been a struggle for me as well. And, and for me, a lot of times what I have to do is a spiritual practice to help me. And a lot of times when I pray, I have a physical posture that's tied to the prayer. And, and the one for this is just, it's kind of simple, is I just, uh, I just close my hands. And, and I'll say the phrase, 
God, I've been living like it's mine. And then I'll open my hands. Okay, God, once again, I want to open my hands and my heart to you. And I want it to be yours. This week I did that. Just, oh, man, God, one more time. I'm studying this. I go, ah, I live like it's mine. God, would you just open my heart again? I open it to you. And I'll do this multiple times, just a simple thing, same prayer, because I realize how hard it is in my heart. And you might want to do the same thing if this is you. If you're listening to this, you're like, oh, man, I think this is a problem for me. Get a spot today and this week and just go, all right, God, I'm living like this. I don't want to be like that. Can you help me to live more like this? And it might just help you. And the other thing I would tell you is I've obviously confessed this to several hundred of my closest friends, uh, but it does help to tell someone. And so find someone you trust. Maybe it's in your small group of friends, your spouse. Spouses is a great one to talk to. And just go, I, I think I'm, I'm living tight-fisted. I think I have a problem. I think I've got an acquisition problem. And just talk about it, share it, encourage each other. Talk through next steps, what are you going to do about it? But my hope is that we are a church that doesn't hide from this. It doesn't pretend it doesn't exist, but we deal with it and we try to help each other. And so what I want to do to close is actually do a time of prayer together. And what I'd ask is, and nobody's looking around, just bow your heads, would you? And, and, and what I want you to do is if, if you think this might be you and you're like, oh man, I just feel like there's some changes I need to make. Put your hands out and just close them. God, this is my prayer. God, first, it's just a simple confession that for far too long, I've lived tight-fisted. I've lived like it's mine. And I know better. So God, would you help me to unleash this and open my hands to you? Might I live open-handed in this world knowing that I'm a steward, not an owner, that it's entrusted to me, not given to me forever. Would you help me be generous and kind? Would you help me to be content with what you've provided? Would you lead me to a community where I don't hide these things, but I'm open about them? And might I be generous laying up treasures in heaven, not storing them up here for me? God, I'd ask you to do the same thing in every heart here. What's clear is it's so easy for this to get into our hearts and take over. It's so easy to not even see it. God, right now, Holy Spirit, I ask you to just be very clear, just making people know, is this you? Is it you? And then, God, might we work to become open-handed so that we might hear, well done, good steward. Might we hear the words, you lived life well, that loaned life that you got. Might we be a church that encourages each other to live this way too. God, that's my prayer. I prayed this on my friends here and in my life in the name of Christ, our Savior and our teacher. And everyone agreed and said, amen, amen, amen. Yeah, well, thank you so much for being here. I know some of you, this is your first time. So glad you're here. And, uh, and now Gina is gonna come up. Uh, we really just have one last piece in the service. We end every service with next steps, just things, uh, announcements really. So could you give Gina a hand as she walks up? Yeah, good to be with you guys today. A um, couple things. First, uh, we've got an opportunity coming up as the weather starts to turn. We've got a lot of landscaping to do around here. Quick question. Anybody here think they have a green thumb, like like enjoy gardening and planting? Nobody wants to admit it. Now, okay, there we go. One. One person confesses, but we actually have this opportunity. We actually need people to help with things like mulching and planting, and I have whatever is the exact opposite of a green thumb, and so we could really use your help, and uh, there's a couple opportunities opportunities on Friday, May 5th, and Saturday, May 6th, a couple different shifts, both in the morning and afternoon. And so if you're willing and able to help with that, please go online, sign up. We'd love to have you join us for that. And I promise you, it'll be like pizza or something, some sort of thank you for, uh, for serving that way. So that's the first one. Uh, second, we've got a park play date coming up for those of you who have kids in Hope Kids. So this is, these are kids under the age of fifth grade. And uh, what I find is oftentimes my kids would come home and talk about like friends that they met when they were playing in, in kids ministry. And uh, my son, when he was younger, he'd always come home and be like, yeah, I hung out with these two boys, Ben and Joel, Ben and Joel. And he kept talking about them. And I was like, who are their parents? Like, I want to get to know them. And we find like 
opportunities like this give you a chance not just to hear about different kids, but get to know their whole family. And so we just invite you, if you've got kids in that age group, sign up for this. It's really easy. You're just going to show up at Flick Park on Sunday, May 7th, right after this 11 a.m. service. Uh, the park's about two minutes away from here, really close. It's got a great playground. And just come and hang out. Lunch will be provided. So it's just going to be a good time for your kids to hang out with other kids and for you to get to know the entire family. We do need uh, you to sign up for that so we can plan for food. So if you can go to the website and sign up for that, that'll help us out a lot as well. Um, last thing, well, two more things, but first, at the in this afternoon, we've got an event that's taking place in this gym. Uh, there's a ministry that we work with that serves refugees, and they're doing like a training and education event here. And so if you are able to help stack some chairs right at the end of the service, that would help us out. You just stack them in stacks of eight. Uh, if you can't, if your back's hurting, don't do it. You know, just leave it there, but we'd love your help in doing that. Uh, last thing, if this is your church home and you came prepared to give an offering, there's a box in the back corner over there, or you can also give online at hopecommunity.net. So great to be with all of you today. Hope you have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next Sunday, everyone.